start by outlining what I plan on covering today. Um, so this seminar is intended to discuss strategy and third speeches. Um, things that I'm not planning on covering are like the very, very basic components of what a third speech is. Um, I will like briefly check for people who are here's like level of experience, make sure that that's not necessary. We do it extremely briefly, but that won't be the focus. Um, and I'm also not going to focus on weighing in thirds, even though it's very important for strategy, because I know that there was another seminar done on advanced weighing. So I'm just going to try and talk about topics that I don't think were covered in the other seminar. Um, if at any point you have questions about material, um, you can feel free to use like the hand raise feature or write it in the chat in a PM or publicly or just unmute and ask. Um, it'll also leave time for questions after the seminar as well. Um, so like, I mean, I might, I might be awkward to ask, but like, I'm not going to spend too much time going over um, what a third actually is. It's just very briefly, you're just explaining why the claims brought by your team are more important than the other team. You are not bringing in new constructive material, but you are adding new ref, you're adding new weighing. And as I discussed in the seminar, you can also buffer claims that your team has said to make them more persuasive. Um, the things specifically that I plan on covering are firstly a consideration of what path to victory is and why thinking about that is really important for third speeches. Um, secondly, how, how you should be using prep time strategically as a third speaker, um, how to strategically structure a speech, how to strategically help your own case if there are missing links without adding a new material, breaking deadlocks, and then this, and then just some extraneous like strategic pointers. Um, if at any point I'm talking too quickly, which I have a tendency to, you can also let me know about that in the chat as well, or just unmute and, and let me know. So to start off with, um, I just want to discuss a consideration of a path to victory, which is a term that's like used quite a lot in the Canadian debate circuit these days. So basically what a path to victory means is given what has happened in the round so far, what is a pathway or the path of least resistance or the easiest way that you can convince the judge that you have won the round? The reason why this is really important to think of is that in the vast majority of rounds where teams are like similarly leveled, or even just at the higher level, like WSDC, um, at like WSDC and at higher level comms, it's nearly impossible to be able to win every single clash in like an eight minute period. Therefore, what you need to do in a third is prioritize kind of like a puzzle. What is a way that in the finite time that I have, I'm able to convince the judge that I've won the round. So I think you can almost think of a path to victory as kind of like a puzzle where you're trying to find a way to make everything that's happened in the round um, basically come together in a way that persuades the judge that you win. So just to give some examples about what a path to victory would look like in different circumstances or like di differences between the path to victory and just trying to win every single clash. So for example, let's say that, that there's a debate where you're losing quite badly but there was a really, really good constructive argument that had come out by your second speaker. Most of your other, most of the rest of your case has been like absolutely obliterated. Um, but the new constructive argument by your second speaker, like, was not responded to at all. Anything you can use it to waive best material by other teams rather than trying to bail out the rest of your case it is kind of already being demolished by the other team um an example of a path to victory in this case could be to like strate um could, could be to really focus on weighing in the the argument brought by your second speaker into the debate um flagging that it was unresponded to that it's not new material because it came out in second and explaining why that claim alone is sufficient to outweigh the other team because it's kind of the best shot that you have um because you know that the rest of the material simply was not strong enough. Another example could be if a weighing of your case was incredibly clear um, by your other speakers and was never contested, um, but th what the other team has done is just to chip away at the mechanism to like concede the weighing and then just to be like, but you never prove why that weighing actually matters because you don't prove the argument. Um, in your third speech, you're going to want to focus on making sure that you like really prove the mechanism and then only briefly flag that the weighing is winning rather than reweighing the case into the debate because it was already something that was left standing. Um, a final example could be if there are two clashes, one you are losing very, very clearly, and one of the clashes is, is, is a lot closer. Um, in this case, it might be implausible to decisively win both clashes through things like direct rebuttal. So a more useful strategy might be to frame the clash you were using, that you are losing clearly as being the less important clash, frame the clash that's close as being the crucial one in winning the debate, and then spend the remainder of, of your speech like winning that clash. And what I note that what a path to victory is, 
when the time that your debate reaches the third speech is often different from what you thought the burdens of your team would be or the contentious issues at the beginning of the debate. So it's often very based on how the material of one team interacts with the material of the other team. So you need to adapt based on the material that's being said in the round um, and then kind of think about how you can win based on what's happened in the debate thus far. So what I wanna do now are give a couple of examples of motions um, where, I, where I think that strategic thinking about a path to victory in a third speech can be really important. Um, so the first motion, I'm also going to post it in the chat as well and I'll read it out so that people who are watching later can see. Um, this house would allow families of deceased loved ones to agree not to publicize photos. Um, this is like the brief version, but how the motion was worded is like grotesque photos of death um, in cases where it was quite brutal. Leslie, you were on opposition. So at the beginning of the debate, um, you think that the main clash or like the main approach on opposition is going to be that we need these photos um, being released to the public because photos can create social change. I.e., if you are like a refugee, I'm like Alan Curdy, for example, and you're lying on the beach, this can then be used to mobilize entire social movements because it's able to basically generate a level of empathy. Um, however, Prop does a couple of things that are quite sneaky, such that your initial plan of like the argument that you think is most important on op um, becomes quite marginalized. Um, and they do this in uh, in a couple ways. Um, the first way that they're sneaky is that they explain why simply because you're allowing families to have the option of a veto, a lot of families are still going to allow these photos to be publicized for a variety of different reasons. Um, they might just like not really care about privacy when like the most like the, the greatest loss has already happened. Um, they might care or like they, they might value trying to use social awareness as a form of catharsis or like one to try and mobilize forms of social change as someone's legacy. So they explain why like only in a marginal number of cases are families actually going to take this option. And then they explain why that changes the weighing of the debate because you can still get social change from the photos that are being released to people. This is about like the 20 or 30% of families who are going to suffer a lot emotionally. That's one way how they're able to like outframe that argument. And then a second thing that they do is they also run a principle about like even if opposition is able to mobilize forms of social change in the future, the state has a greater obligation to current families who they fail to, to, to protect when a loved one has been killed and therefore they have a duty to respect the agency of these people, even if that might lead to harms for future people. So given that this is how the round has gone, um, I think that there's a couple of things that you might want to consider in your path to victory in two ways that you can win the debate. The first thing you have to prove in a third is why you need a large number of photos to be released in order to get the kind of social change that you're talking about in first and second op. So yes, you can try and do like direct rebuttal to prove why why a lot of families are going to like use the veto, but I think that at some point you're going to have to bite the bullet a bit and just can see that a lot of families are going to agree to publicize these photos. Therefore, an important link that you would need to rebuild is why you need a very, very large percentage of photos being released. And I think that there's some reasons that you can give for this, right? Like, I think you can run framing about why the kind of photos that are going to be vetoed are probably going to be the most gruesome ones and therefore those ones will be the most important in creating forms of social change. Um, I think that you can run that like different people have different conceptions of empathy based on their own lived experiences. There's often not one photo that's necessary in doing this, but when different organizations can use different photos to increase the likelihood of one of those photos tapping into like someone's empathetic heartstrings and then creating forms of social change. So you're, you're pivoting in the debate to not only prove the initial link of why social change can happen from empathetic photos and why it's good, but you now need to reshift why you need like a large number of photos in order to access that impact. Um, I think that the second thing that you would want to prove in your path to victory is why future people are important slash why the state has obligations to like future people who will be protected from forms of social change rather than the unique moral status of families. So you, so even if you prove the first thing about why you need multiple photos to get that change, you also need to explain why that change ought be like valued by a state and why it's justified to prioritize that change at the expense of like current people. Um, so I think that what this example demonstrates is that how you think that the debate's going to go 
often differs in terms of what the other team says and the burdens that you need to prove in a third often change before your speech based on rebuttal and framing that another team gives. And it's important to be very adaptable to how the debate is going um, and to constantly think strategically about the links that you need to prove in order to make sure that you're being on clash and that you're actually following the debate that's happening. Um, just I'll, I'll, I'll give a, um, a briefer example for, for, for another example of when a path of victory would be important, but in the motion, this house would implement quotas for women in high government positions. Um, so initially in the debate, um, let's say that you are on proposition, you just like give a bunch of reasons about why this kind of representation is going to be good for women. Like you want a brief principle, but you also just run things about why high government positions um, are unique in having forms of policy control and changing political culture to be more pro-women in general, to change forms of like sexist expectations and to change things like gender norms. And like you thought this was like a really gut heavy motion because clearly there are so many benefits. Um, rather than like, and then off, um, which you're not expecting, their main push is like not really on like a principled front. I mean, not, and it's not really on like why these like why these positions are not good for women. But their but their main push is to point out that in the majority of cases where this motion would likely be implemented or is relevant. Um, there are already large forms of organic change where female participation in politics has increased a lot in the past couple decades. And at the very least, they give structural reasons about why there's a positive trend where it's likely to increase in the future. And therefore they frame the comparative as being, do we want to do this now or do we want to wait three or four decades where, where we're likely to get this kind of positive change anyways? And like they prove that reasonably well. And then they just weigh minor impacts about why organic change is like better. Um, in terms of how legitimate these women are actually viewed, how they're treated by parties, which is then necessary in actually getting policies that are important. Um, therefore, in your path to victory, you might have thought that initially you needed to like weigh the principle a lot about why it's justified to intervene in like democracy, but that doesn't become super important. At this point in the debate, what you need to do is explain why organic change is like insufficient um, and really focus on proving that that link. So you can frame the speech as like, they never actually contest any kind of principle or the or the merits of the impacts of doing this their weighing is contingent on the benefits of representation being uncomparative so if i can prove to you that organic change is unlikely to happen or is unlikely to be comprehensive enough to actually get the desired benefits that we're talking about we're able to win um so that's most of what i have for path to victory basically just thinking about given what's happened in the debate what are kind of the newer burdens that you have to prove to prove or just to like weigh your case uniquely into the round um are there any questions about that before i move on Great, once again, if you feel uncomfortable asking it like in the Zoom, you can also feel free to PM me and I'll keep my eyes on the chat. Okay, um, the next thing I wanna talk about briefly is how to use prep time strategically as, as a third speaker. Um, I understand that in, in a lot of cases, um, like what you're supposed to do in prep is determined by your coach and also by team dynamics in general. But in cases where you have more flexibility, I'm um, at certain tournaments to decide how to use prep um, or like how you're supposed to use prep is less structured um, or when you're allotted time what to do in that time. Um, I think that it's useful to keep some pointers in mind that at least for me have been quite helpful um, in delivering a great speech. Um, I personally think that in world school style, given that prep is like so long and you have a full hour, a lot of how well you do in, in a round is determined on the kind of notes and the kind of case you have in prep. And that a lot of the smartest ideas um, come not, not really from like thinking during while someone else is talking and you need to multitask under a lot of time pressure. Um, but a lot of it is like the kind of things you're able to think of in prep in order to give a really strategic and well thought out speech. Um, I think there's a few useful considerations. I think that firstly, I understand that there are constraints to this in a lot of cases, but I really do think that as a third, you should have some time either by yourself or on a five person team with another teammate in order to be like preparing for your third speech. There are like four speeches in a WSDC team. I think that there can be an, a, a tendency to over prioritize the case, which yes, is important given that you have like less time during the round to be able to like fix that. But you like, in my opinion, 10, like at least 10 10 minutes, preferably closer to 20 minutes as a, as, as a third speaker to be able to think about your speech is ideal. And if you have the ability to advocate for that, um, I think that that's, a, that, that that's a good thing. But even if you have five to 10 minutes, a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about still applies. 
I think that in this time, there's a, there's a few things that you can think about that will help you give the most strategic speech. I think that firstly, this is like kind of the obvious one that I think that most people do, um, is that you just want to think of rough to like major arguments that the other side is likely to bring. I think that particularly, um, given that WSDC motions tend to be like sometimes more stock and more um, basic and like they're not usually super complex, it can be easier to like intuit what the main trade-offs are likely to be and what the main pushes of the other team are likely to be. And I think that thinking of like a rebuttal sequence can be really helpful. Um, I know that some teams like to discuss a rebuttal sequence between the second speaker and the third speaker to think about how RAF is likely to like evolve. We can likely predict those kinds of things. Um, I think that there's some people who disagree with this, but in my opinion, thinking of RAF to like the obvious arguments is more important than trying to find like niche silver bullets that the other team might run argumentatively or like really creative third arguments that, that they might run because the probability that like really creative things that you um, that you think the other team might run actually get run is like a lot lower than a high likelihood that they're just going to run like the, like the obvious stuff that you think of so in terms of like efficient time allocation it's a safer bet to focus on having wrath to the obvious material is often stronger anyways um i think that also though there's a few other things that can be helpful that i think are less commonly done during silent prep I think that you might, I think that it's helpful to think about how, ways to rebuild your own case. Um, because as I'm gonna talk about later on as well. Oh, sorry, I seem to admit someone. Um, as I'm gonna talk about later on as well, in a third, you are not just oh no, I was um how long was I muted for? Just a second. Okay, okay. Um so as I'm gonna to touch on later, um, you have to do rebuilding in a third and not just rebuttal. So I think it's often good to think about the likely ways that your case is going to be attacked. Obviously it's hard to, to, to predict like all the reputation that another team is going to say, because I think that there's more options of how to refute a claim than there are arguments that the other team is likely to run. But I think that in a lot of cases, there's quite obvious rebuttal that tends to be given to claims or sometimes there's like silver bullet rebuttal that is quite strong such that if it is given to your argument it will like severely diminish the effectiveness of that case so i think that in addition to prepping ref it's often useful to take a minute or two to think are there are there responses that the other team can give to like kind of break this claim or that will do severe damage and when you're able to think of that try and prep some responses to that that you can then use to be able to rebuild the claim i think that like not only is this good for your own speed because you've anticipated how to solve problems with the case. I also think that if you have time, re-communicating this to the team can be really valuable as well. Um, I think in general, it's good to have someone who's like devil's advocating. Um, like that's what we call it on like on the Canadian team. But like what it basically just means are like pretending that you're on the other team and then thinking about what you would say to an argument to to diminish its effectiveness while you're building the argument itself in order to ensure that it's a sound argument that cannot be easily deconstructed and that you're plugging in a lot of holes that exist but i think that even if you end up doing this later on in prep um later on in prep if you find that there's like clear ways that the argument can be um mitigated even if you don't really have the ability to reorient the case and oftentimes it still is like a strong argument even if there are ways to make it a lot weaker it can also be good to re-communicate that back into the team such that you can build um, more preemption into first and second speeches, which I think is just like a thing that is under prioritized um, in WSDC right now um, and can really help with like speaks and just to have a stronger case overall. So, so you, you can think about rebuilding and then re-communicate that to your team, but for your own speech, you can also anticipate that. So in the example that I gave previously about families um, vetoing photos, I think that in that debate, um, like if you're on off, you might, I think that anticipating the gov framing or the response that a lot of families are going to allow these photos and then if, if in prep you've already thought of some reasons about why a large number of photos is important it can make that strategic pivot in the path to victory a lot more easily um i think that additionally it's valuable to think about different ways that you're able to theme your speech and different like burdens and stuff that are likely to come up in the round um i think that 
thinking about themes ahead of time can have the disadvantage of like being less adaptable. Um, I think it, it can be quite risky if you have a very set idea about how you think a debate is likely to unfold. And then if it unfolds differently, um, at least I know I personally struggled with this, but you don't want to fall into the trap of debating the round that you thought was going to happen in prep rather than the debate that actually happens. But I think that if you have an idea of your head about depending on what the other team says, here's what different path of victories could be. Here's different theming that I, that, that I can use it can help like just have a clear organizational structure when the round's happening. Cause I, I think that it's in the round, it's often better to be thinking of strong ref and strong wing um, rather than to be spending a lot of mental energy on like the organizational component of your speech and thinking about ways to, to like do that the most effectively. Cause I think that it can be quite distressing if especially the other team's running a lot of content if you're panicking about how to fit that together in a way that actually makes sense thematically. I think that finally in prep, you can spend some time thinking about like worst case scenarios. Um, although I think this is less important than the than the other thing. So basically like in a debate that might be very, very model heavy um, or where the motion is a little bit more ambiguous, if the team debates the debate in a way that's very, very different from what you like have envisioned in prep as your own team, what are ways that you're able to like adapt in third and not only in your own speech, but like bench talk is really important or to help your team adapt as well. Um, I think that this is less important because usually there's more discussion of how this would unfold with with your with your entire team in prep. We're considering things like if you're on prop, for example, and op has fiat power, things that they might run, or like if you're on an op um, and a team can model the debate um, in a very particular way. I'm not sure if people remember like the school voucher system motion that was prepared at WSDC a couple years ago, but it was like something about implementing voucher systems where it was quite model intensive, which changed the debate. So like usually in those kinds of motions, you have a team discussion about ways that different models or counter models can impact the round. Um, but in cases where that discussion is lacking or you think that it's very likely that something's going to go wrong, you also might want to give that some consideration in prep as well. So yeah, um, that's it for prep thoughts. Basically just ad advocate for time and use it in a way that's most strategic and do more than just think of rebuttal. Cool, um, the next thing that I wanna talk about is how to strategically order and structure a speech. I'm gonna be emphasizing here less like what the structure of a third is as I flagged at the beginning and more in the different components. How can you organize this in a way that's like the most strategic? Um, so just on introductions, I think that a strategic mistake that's often made is like having an introduction for the sake of having an introduction, or it's often just like rambling or doesn't actually advance the speech at all. Um, well, an intro can be good for style points. And once again, I know that a lot of coaches like have preferences about including it, um, at least in my opinion, or I think with like kind of the younger gen of schools judges, like it's definitely not a requirement. And I think that with an intro, as in most components of a speech, do not just have one for the sake of it if you don't think it's actually adding anything meaningful to your speech. Um, another mistake is that at least I think that this is more like North America based teams, um, but I, I at least know that there is um, a, a phase where a lot of people and like I've definitely seen international like a lot of international teams do this will start a third with making observations about these strategic errors of another team. The problem is a lot of the time the strategic errors that are identified are either incorrect are not the main ones. And importantly, the strategic significance of the errors that you're observing are never explained. So there might be a bit of like case tension between a first or a second speaker on the other team. And then a third speaker will say something like, silver bullet, like they had some case tension. This means that we like win the debate. Well, that's very much not how forms of case tension are often adjudicated or are supposed to be adjudicated. Um, so it, I think it's important to make sure that if you're doing the whole strategic error intro thing, which can be effective, um, you are choosing things that are actually damaging for the other team, especially because like an intro sets the tone for how the judge is likely to perceive the remainder of your speech, um, especially with like schools debate where like the judges might be like tired and they've had to sit through quite a, a lot of long speeches and their attention span is already waning. Like you don't want to give them an excuse to like not be attentive during your speech or to undermine your own credibility as a speaker. So I think that like choosing like ridiculous strategic errors, which, I, which I've seen happen quite a lot before, um, can be quite like a foolish thing to like do. So if you do it, make sure that you feel confident that they're actually good ones. There also should be a reason why like you're not just like in your themes if they're highly like related to that and why you're putting them at the beginning. But I think that importantly as well, whenever this is not only for the strategic air intros, 
but it's also just like generally when you're making strategic observations and doing meta around things like case tension, you always want to explain why attention or why a contradiction or why not fulfilling a burden actually matters and how the debate should be like adjudicated. So if there are two characterizations that a team gives that are tense with one another, you might want to say something along the lines of like, they try to claim that people act in two opposite ways. We pick the second one because that aligns with our case and we agree that that one's true and they literally concede it's true. What this means is that firstly, they effectively concede our argument, which is based on the same characterization that they agree is going to happen in the majority of cases, meaning that you need to weigh our mechanism into the round, even if they try and refute it with their other material. But importantly, the way that they try and outweigh our case is by proving both of their arguments that are based on contradictory premises. Each of those arguments individually that cannot exist alongside each other are not sufficient to outweigh our main argument for X, Y, and Z reason, meaning that their combination of like smaller impacts cannot win them the debate. So just stuff like that to try and explain um, why forms of contradictions or tensions are actually important. I think that other ways that you can do like strategic type intros um, that I've found to be helpful, I guess it's just more of like a structure thing, but um, illustrating a claim or, or particularly flipping an illustration of the other side. So if a team has like used an example throughout their entire bench, which is kind of a narrative building thing that a certain schools teams like England um, do quite effectively, it can often be useful to like flip that illustration. So for example, if you have a team that consistently is like, so let's say that the motion is something like, um, this house believes that we could economically sanction um, like nuclear states or states with poor human rights records or like something around sanctioning a state for doing a bad thing. Um, and let's just see that there's a that that there's like a team who keeps giving the example of how sanctions don't work because of what Iran looks like right now. So we've sanctioned Iran for many, many years. Um, they are still a theocracy, the government is still bad and oppressive and they're kind of resuming their nuclear program. They just backed out of the deal anyways. Um, and a team has like pushed that throughout their like entire bench. Um, I think that in an intro, if you say something like, well, actually, obviously Iran is not perfect right now, but uniquely because of sanctions, they, they were brought to the negotiating table to at the very least have some kind of like nuclear agreement in the first place. Um, I think that like re-illustrating a very contentious claim can be an effective way to like set the tone strategically. I also think that it's often useful to focus on comparatives or burdens that have not been like fulfilled um, and to kind of just point out like what a comparative is or like what the fundamental wing of your case is. So in, 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 in a motion that's like tying development aid to forms of political rights or to like democracy, um, I think that an example of like trying to weigh your case into the debate could be framing poverty itself as being a form of like violence um, or being like, or just finding some kind of like rhetorical weighing about why people think to, people being deprived of basic needs is like a larger harm to your agency than like the right to vote or something. Um, so that's like an example of changing wing and then re like burdens um, in, a, in a regrets motion, just something like they never actually like their case is based on a certain conception of the world unfolding. They never prove why that counterfactual is actually likely, which I think is a more like commonly used intro. Um, so just like st kind of strategic things. I think another kind of strategic intro. Um, so in, in a debate where your case is quite impactful on paper, but your team has lacked style and rhetoric, or they've lacked the content of explaining why an impact actually matters. Um, it can also be a good thing to just start your speech with illustrating the significance of your case. So like adding not really a couple examples, but just doing some like world building about what your side of the house actually looks like um, and why the debate is actually like as severe as your teammates are claiming. And once again, um, like rhetorical interests like that are often not super helpful if your team has already used those examples or has done the same thing. So this is kind of like a similar note of advice that I've been giving throughout the seminar of you wanna be adaptable in your third based on how the debate has happened, what the strength of your teammates were in that particular round. So like, if, if, if you've already flipped the main example, don't start your third like that. If your speech is well illustrated, don't start with illustrations. If, you, if, like, if your team's already said six times that they never fulfilled their burden in a, in a regrets motion, it can be redundant to put that at the top of a third. But these are just some ideas about like strategically how to set the tone of your speech. Now getting into the meat of your speech um, with themes, in terms of like how to theme, I just want to flag that you don't need to feel obligated. So I personally think it's quite advisable to always use themes for third speeches. Um, like, uh, like, and like by themes, I mean like themes or questions or like whatever it, 
iteration of that there is rather than just doing like rebuilding and rebuttal um for, for, for the reason that I think that it's just so conventional at this point that like a lot of judges are going to be confused and think that your speech is disorganized and harm your style points when you're not doing that. But I don't think that you need to feel obligated to fit everything that's happened into round into themes that you have. So if a team, for example, runs a new third argument that is like not related to any of their other material and you don't want to create a whole new theme to just like respond to that argument, especially if there are kind of like two or three mismatch sub points so it can't really be themed easily, um, you can often just say, I'm going to start with extraneous rebuttal at the top of my speech and deal with that then. Um, and if you have a new argument or you have small snippets of material that weren't responded to, but that you think are like important, you can also weigh that in at the top of your speech, like never responded to our third argument. Here's what, even if you don't think that we win any other clash, it's, it's already like round winning. Or if a team, like sometimes teams will run an argument that should fit under a theme and like half the arguments like related to the title of the claim and they just have some like random material. They want to deal with that random material. These are all things that you don't have to fit into themes. I'm um, sorry, this is more like organizational stuff that I just want to cover just in case because I'm not really sure about um like levels of everyone who's going to be watching. But in terms of how you should be strategically creating and ordering themes, I think that a common like strategy mistake is running themes based on the order of arguments that either your team ran or that the other team in the debate said, and then just theming under what your constructive material was. Um, so like a lot of the time how this happens, like if there's like a principal theme and a practical theme, people are just like, I'm going to have two themes in my speech, firstly, like the principal and secondly, the practical. And then if you have like a third argument that often becomes its own theme. So you basically just theme according to like the cases that were run by both teams. Um, or according to your own case, which is, I think, that the trap that happens more. To be clear, in a lot of, in certain rounds, there are cases where this is the most clear way to order themes because these were the contentious issues and this is what actually matters. But I definitely don't think that ordering your speech based on your own case or, or another team's case should be a crutch because those often are, like, th those often are not the very contentious things you have to prove for the, for, for the examples and for the reasoning of the path of victory stuff that I gave earlier in the seminar. Um, so you often need to deviate from what arguments were and you just want to be very careful of not falling into that trap. Um, on the flip side, when you're choosing themes to, to like keep in, in terms of what to keep in mind, number one, the path of victory stuff I said, um, I think that typically you want to theme things that were spoken about more in the debate. So I think it's, it's, it's important to know that just because an argument was spoken about more doesn't make that claim more important if you've already kind of beaten it or if, or if sometimes a team will spend a lot of time on a claim but that claim is bad and a claim that a team spent less time on ends up being the more persuasive material of their case. Um, that being said, I think that typically what's spoken about more are just the most convenient to theme because it's just a lot more organized, the clash is clear, usually teams will prioritize more important material and will be prioritized in the mind of the judge, so you often want to be focusing on things that were just like discussed more. Um, when ordering themes, um, I think that there's a few things to keep in mind in order for your speech to make the most strategic sense. I think that firstly, and this is an important one, it's often good to order themes based on logic. Um, so a lot of debates will ha have a situation where the two themes are kind of contingent on one another, um, especially in certain policy motions where you need to prove a certain premise for the rest of the case to make sense. In these cases, if you have two themes and the second theme is kind of contingent on proving the first theme, you will probably want to make sure that the theme that the rest of the speech or the case is contingent on is like well proven in the context of the speech. So for example, if there's a motion that's like a tough on crime motion, so it's something like you want like longer sentences in high crime areas um, or you just support like harsher parole or like or like one team's getting rid of like harsh things like one team's like getting rid of like prisons or something and like you're opposing that and basically you're just one to make the claim that tough on crime policies deter people which might be dubious but like whatever it's debate land and you're trying to make that argument um in your so you you, you think of your path to victory and you realize that there's like two central things that you need to do number one you need to prove the claim that tough on crime 
policies actually create a form of deterrence in the first place? And then secondly, can you to explain why deterrence and the rights of future people are more important or at the very least are equally as important as present people who are interacting with the justice system, which is quite similar to um, like the, the principal thing that happened in the family vetoing motion. So in this case, it makes a lot more logical sense to start out by proving that deterrence is actually going to happen, given that all of your weighing and the second thing about why deterrence matters is proven on the first premise. You can have all the weighing in the world about why deterrence and future people is important, but if you don't prove the mechanism in, in the first place, your second thing is just going to fall out of the round. So in this case, you want to start by proving or like rebuilding the mechanism of, of deterrence and strengthening that in order to make the latter half of your speech make sense. And like, I think that there can be an exception to this if if the mech absolutely stands and the really contentious part is the wing of, of a claim, like nothing that I'm saying is set in stone, but then intuitively the wing of the claim is easier than proving that. But more importantly, if those things are important to do in the speech, just start with the claim that logically kind of precedes another claim. In addition, to the, in addition to the logical sense thing, I think that it's usually, although quite a few exceptions to this, better to start your speech with material that the other team prioritized rather than like re-pivoting to your own case in order to just making sure that, in order to just make sure that you're being like immediately responsive. Um, um, thus far in the round, Your team has spent a lot more time on like seeing the case than they have on responding to other teams. Um, so it's often likely that your case is being better established and at the very least you sometimes have less to do there and making sure that you have like strong lines of attack um, to another team and to making sure that you're seeming offensive pretty early on in your speech. Um, I think there can be exceptions to this in cases where the other team's case was quite weak and has been taken down quite effectively by the remainder of your team, but your case was was also quite weak, just given that your, your teammates had like good rebuttal thoughts and prep, but did a bad job of presenting the case. Um, I think that in this situation, it can often be actually useful to focus on fixing your own case and on your own impacts because doing more rebuttal is going to have um, a more like marginal effect. But in cases where the cases are relatively equal strength, even just for like conventional school's wisdom, um, I think it is often better to just be immediately responsive and it also reduces, I think, the likelihood of forms of repetitiveness. Um, and, then, and, it, and then I think that after you consider these two things, um, once again, like a lot of what I'm seeing links back to path to, path to victory, but I really do think it's the crucial thing in giving us a strategic third. Uh, if you want to deal with clashes that make sense and like selling what your path to victory is and just structuring your speech where it makes it very clear to the judge um, why they should kind of give you their ballot. Um, finally, on strategic like internal organization within themes, I think this is a lot more variable between just what different speakers prefer doing. And I've, I, I think that there's a blanket way about how to strategically structure material within themes themselves. Um, what I find works the best for me is to start out with more mitigatory responses and then move into meta as a theme progresses. But this is by no means like the end all and be all. I just want to give an example of how I think that this can work. Um, so typically what, what I will do is start out by like attacking logic and flipping claims and then wait at the end. So in the debate, this house supports open borders or like free immigration. Um, opposition will likely run an argument about how this will harm the developing world because a brain drain is likely to like take place. So I think that a strategic way to order um, this theme can be to firstly directly refute that a brain drain is likely to happen um, by attacking links in the claim. So for example, the link that qualified professionals are the people who are going to leave in a world where there's free immigration because they have um, more, more, more money um, to be able to stay and the lack to be able to keep money alongside things like family and like linguistic ties, um, they'll, they'll prioritize that more when they have some kind of financial base. And then secondly, offer forms of mitigation, i.e. like re remittances often happen. I mean that even if qualified people do leave, they often send more money back, so that's more important. And I think that at the end, 
um, weighing why even if some people are left behind for both principled and practical reasons, people who end up moving both matter more from like a utilitarian perspective where more people experience an, an increase in their quality of life, um, but also why people should, should be allowed to use their agency and leave, even if it harms other people within their own states. Um, I don't think that the order of how you do this really matters, but I wanna make a couple of strategic observations. I think that firstly, having different combinations of rebuttal can be the most strategic. So you never wanna to get too wrapped up in just doing direct rebuttal. So, like there's certainly some cases where that can be the most effective, but it's often good to vary the kind of rebuttal that you're offering in order to defeat a claim in multiple kinds of ways. And I'm sure it was evident in other like rebuttal seminars that was given. Um, but I also think that this way can just make sure that you always kind of have that wing and you always have that like even if. So you're just giving the judges like more reasons to like vote to like vote for um, your team. Um, either by directly attacking logic. And then it's like, if one thing doesn't work, I think you increase the safety blanket by giving more reasons about why you want a particular theme um, that I just think can help in allowing you to like win more of the major clashes. So in my opinion, this order makes the most logical sense for like my brain um, in order to start small and then go big. But especially if you have like time management issues or if you just prefer a different style of speaking, I think that you can start with like meta at the beginning of themes, provided that you just have it in the, in the speech at some point, because I just think that meta is like really important generally. Um, this is most of what I have for organization stuff. This is much my more, I guess, like basic stuff for thirds, but I think some of the strategy stuff about organization and like weighing and stuff is really important. Um, obviously, I said I wasn't going to touch on the wing stuff because it was in because it was in another seminar, but I do just briefly want to flag this is like a super strategically important part of third speeches. Um, I think that a useful way to improve wing can be with your like school's team or just like before or even just like with like your friends or like in the shower when you're thinking about debate. It can often be useful to think of a few weighing mechanisms that are unique and that are powerful, kind of have them in your back pocket and not have to think of these during the rounds. So I think there's a finite number of, of ways to weigh why a claim is actually important. When it comes to like number of people impacted, vulnerability of the person, obligations of the state, exclusivity of, of an impact, how short versus long term something is, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's often just like, or just like as a debate improvement thing, I found it helpful to kind of know the different wings such that you such that you you mostly just have to think about which wing fits into which speech and fits into which argument rather than trying to like invent new wing mechanisms when you're when you're trying to prioritize also thinking of other things during a debate overall. Yeah, so this is with organization. This isn't directly organizationally related to strategy, but um, the final thing that I wanted to just make a comment on is briefly like meta debate and third speeches. So this is when you're doing the thing of like, they didn't fulfill that burden, broadly weighing stuff, um, forms of framing. I already briefly touched on this, but I think that there is a tendency to run a lot of like the big picture and framey stuff. Um, which is really good, but I think that there's two main traps. Um, trap one is that there's there's often, a, in my, a, what I found when judging schools debate, a lot of internal repetitiveness with, within a team of meta debate. So like all speakers will push the exact same burden on the other team. And yes, like cohesiveness of your team and like constantly pushing something is good. A lot of coaches encourage it. It can be good to push a narrative, but especially if like your other speakers have said it, you really don't want to, you really don't want to dwell on it, especially if they've already explained why it mattered. So like find like new meta strategy stuff. And then the second problem is like, you need to explain why the meta stuff is like important always. Like not just the stuff about like, they never like fulfilled X kind of burden, but even when you're doing things like you're trying to like weigh it, or you're trying to like weigh a claim for example or you're adding framing um about like I'm, I'm also not going to elaborate on like what fr framing is and do a seminar on that but there are, there are quite a lot of online resources and if you want some of those i mean, you know send me a message after this but like if you're running framing about why another team's impact only applies in like a very marginal number of countries for example you always want to explain why the kind of like a meta rebuttal that, that that you're doing shifts fundamental weighing of the round and explain how that interacts with clashes rather than just leaving it in a vacuum for the judge to decide why, are, why your strategic observations are important. It's often not intuitive, um, especially if the other team says that, like, says that they're not important. Um, and they're often just like, it's often unclear how, how they actually interact with clashes. So just be mindful of those two things. Next major topic area. Um, about strategically helping your own case, which in my opinion, this might be like the most important thing I say. So I just want to like, in my opinion, a huge problem um, in schools debate is there's 
there's often a huge emphasis on thirds of beating the other team and of doing rebuttal, which is like super important and probably the main goal of a thirds. But in some, in nearly every third, but also depending on how some brands unfold in, in particular, doing reconstruction is very, very important. Even if you have great rebuttal, if nothing ends up standing from your team either, because either your case was op- was also super refuted or your team did a bad job of developing the case such that there were a lot of missing links, this becomes very, very risky to actually win the round because there's there's certain rounds where it's like sometimes judges will be like everything was like a loss, which is often like not the case, but it's often said. Or like both teams have very, very little positive material as left standing um, because both teams' cases are just like very, very well, well refuted. Then what the judge often has to decide on are like very marginal impacts. So like even if you literally refuted like 95% of the other team's case really well, if they had a third argument that was like kind of bad, but it kind of stands, or, like you have like a sub point that you might've like not heard that stands, these are often just easy ways for the judge to give the ballot to like the other team. And I think that it's actually like a lot of especially in motions that are not prepared and there are often cases where it's just easier to find logical holes in a case than to like think of reasons about why something is good um so there often are cases where your team had great rebuttal but the case was a lot weaker and then in a third you're like well what do I do so obviously one way that that you can do is just even if your case is highly mitigated if you are very very confident that your case is going to have more left standing still than the other team because their case was just so bad and like you know that you have so much good rebuttal in those cases you can kind of prioritize that but i think that in, in a lot of other cases um when it's when it's really unclear which team's winning the, the rebuttal battle it's often good to reshift and then to fix your own case which as i mentioned regardless of how the debate unfolds you often should have some reconstruction but just bear in mind the cases where this is like super important I think that there are a few things to keep in mind when doing rebuilding. The obvious one is just to listen to the core ways um, that your case is being attacked and like main rebuttal that's being given. Um, the thing that I will say about this that's important is that I think that there's often a tendency to over-prioritize ways that your case was, was attacked by, um, by earlier speakers on the on the other team's bench because it's just easier to have good listening skills during earlier speeches rather than when you're panicking before your speech so you you don't want to just be listening let's say you're like third prop you don't just want to be listening to how second off um to how first off attacked your speech um at the beginning of like the LO for two minutes if there's a new rebuttal even if it comes in like the last minute of second off you you're still you're still responsible for addressing that do you want to make sure that you're listening to all speeches and if you have tracking issues um it can often be good to like help to have your teammates help track speakers especially if they're learning a lot of rebuttal toward the end of speeches that's kind of the obvious ones I think there's two less obvious pieces of advice when it comes to reconstruction um in thirds I think at the first that you want to listen to weighing that is being given um against your own case um so given that a lot of debate is one not just based on like this if your argument was logically sound but how another team framed their case into the debate and how they weighed the importance of an impact into the round you you like you don't just have to refute the logic of claims and it's actually not advisable to just like refute that but you but you 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 should very much also refute like weighing mechanisms that are being given by other teams or ways that they're trying to like frame out your case so if a team let's say there's a debate about like whether state should like encourage like automation or something about like protecting um workers whose jobs are lost from automation at the expense of like general economic growth in some kind of way um a team has like a weighing argument of like even if the economy is like better the state has unique obligations to like workers and particularly even if job loss is not that large in all industries the kind of workers who are being laid off by automation tend to be lower skilled workers who have been oppressed the most by like the state and like that's not a constructive argument but it's like set in like third and like third prop and your third op for like 30 seconds things like refuting that kind of weighing can be important or if you're being fo- like if, if one team's concentrating on the number of people who are impacted by a policy being really large, but then the other team is like, even if there's a diffused benefit. So like for, I think a good example of this is like a free trade debate. Um, So one team is, because every single person is able to benefit from things like lower prices and a greater availability of goods. And then and then another team is like, well, there's a very concentrated harm um, for people who are, who are unemployed and who are losing jobs. And let's say like the other arguments about populism and stuff are not are not well proven. Um, let's say that the team who focuses on like 
people losing jobs, really suffering because a wage is super important. Um, they, they try and weigh that claim into the rand by, by being like lower prices. Like literally if you save, like if the average American saves like a hundred dollars or like the average person on groceries a year because prices are lower. Yes, a lot of people are being impacted by that, but like the, the, the nature of the impact is small enough it's not going to affect your ability to like pay bills in the majority of cases that I don't really care about that even if only like 30 people lose their jobs they suffer so much um I think that it's often good to like respond to this kind of weighing and in this case you need to re-pivot to explain why a diffused impact that applies to so many people is actually something that I should care about um even if the nature of that impact is one that seems to be less important so you you, you want to be rebuilding your cases based on weighing that is given rather than just on responses that are given and yes, like weighing is a response, but like the difference between like direct rebuttal and mitigation and then um, like actual weighing that's given. Um, I think that finally, and this is super important, you sometimes need to fix arguments that were given, even if the arguments themselves were either not directly attacked or were attacked in ways that were not super persuasive. The reason being, a lot of judges do not just discredit arguments on the basis of what another team said to that argument, but rather arguments are discredited based on the argument not being developed soundly enough in the first place, such that the judge is like, yes, the rebuttal was kind of crap, but there were so many missing links. I never even bought that claim in the first place. And sometimes this is bad interventionist judging, but you need to protect against that anyways. But more importantly, it's very valid if it's not interventionist, if a team never proved a mechanism in like the first place, the judge is perfectly valid in saying that even if rebuttal was bad, they were never persuaded by that claim. And it might just be a strategic choice for the other team to spend less time refuting that claim. So what you want to be doing is asking yourself, especially in cases where you thought that your case was a bit dubious, even if the rebuttal was not fantastic, does it look like, or is it likely that the panel is buying that claim in the first place? And often if the panel is not buying an argument because it was not made well in, in, in first, it can be a good idea to just like ditch that argument, right? You're under, as I flagged with like path to victory and time efficiency things, you're under no obligation. It's often a bad idea to try and bail out the like entirety of your case. But there are circumstances where if you don't prove a thing, you're going to like lose the debate. Or if you don't prove at least something, you're going to lose the debate. Especially in cases as as, as I said, where each team's case was like highly was highly mitigated. So in these cases, what you, what you want to try and do as a third, and this also applies to like seconds as well, is you need to find ways to kind of save your case independently of that being explicitly reconstruction. The difficulty of doing that is that it's often said by judges like, oh, that is just like new material. So we're not going to credit that um, into the debate. Um, very often it, it is new material. I just wanted to flag some ways where I think you can sneakily help buffer or improve your own argument without it being A, with, like, with, without it actually being new material um, or B, sneaky ways to frame it as not being new material. And this is like, applies the most to the reconstruction section of the seminar of just of, of fixing your own case but I think that knowing ways to make new material in thirds because sometimes just like the reality is you sometimes have to say new things in third sometimes your rebuttal is very new so you need to slide in some new some some new analysis um, I, I just want to give some sneaky things that I think apply to like all ways of reconstruction of doing other things in third to make it sound less new I think that firstly it's often good to frame rebuilding a claim as being like rebuttal, even if it's not. So if like literally like the other team never said the hole in the argument that you're trying to fix, if they like kind of hinted at it or they said it implicitly, it's often good to frame what you're doing as being responsive to other material rather than just like adding in like a mechanism. So maybe they made like a vague observation about how people think that like they kind of tried to target toward like your whole case. But if you're able, if you're able to frame it as being rebuttal to the claim that you're trying to fix, um, responsive material is often credited more than material is just seen as being like new constructive. Um, another thing that I found helpful is if your team had like an illustration or an example in an, in an argument, they never actually explained the illustration or the argument, it's often useful to restate what the illustration or the example was and to add new analysis after doing so. This makes it seem less new than just adding the 
adding the new analysis point blank because it sounds like a continuation of analysis that was already given because you're literally using the same illustration the same example by like by like another team and the new explanation then just seems to be a further elaboration on like an example which is like more allowed in thirds rather than adding new new analysis and it's more likely that the judge might forget that the that the new analysis came out in like a third um when they're when when they've heard material that sounds a lot more similar to them than what the rest of the team said um similarly using a poi that was given by your own team to add in a very new response or kind of new constructive material given that like your team already said it the other team had a, had, a, had a chance to engage but i think that couching newness in the language of a poi that was given can definitely be a way to like hide that and to make the judge a lot more inclined to like credit it um another thing can be so in addition to adding in examples to fill in or sorry, to elaborating on illustrations and examples that were given by your teammates to fill in gaps, you can also do the exact opposite of that, which is if you had a case where the, like in like debate land, good mechanisms were given, but the argument seems to be implausible and it was like not well-grounded. I think a really useful thing to do is to add in new examples and new illustrations in a third speech. Very much you can frame it as not being new because you can be like, the mechanism is very clearly given by second. Here's an example of what this would like look like. And when you're explaining the example, if there were like logical things that were being picked on by the other team, um, you can often kind of sneak in some ways to rebut that into the example that, that you're given. So fold some analysis into your example, but just to use that example to increase the persuasiveness of something that you're saying. Um, use the language of my partner said as much as you can. And especially when you do that, um, you don't, it's often good to utilize a response that was said earlier in the case. So this is kind of similar to the example thing and then like add on to that response with like new stuff. So if, there's a, if there was a one line of response that was given that you don't think will be credited because your teammates did not explain it, um, you, you can often kind of just add in the actual explanation or start by giving a response that sounds super similar because like just like using the same heading as your partner but kind of adding new response like, like layered into that. Once again, like a lot of especially stronger judges are not going to credit new, like very new material in thirds, but when it's, when you know that you need it in order to win, or you think that it's gray area, whether it's like new or not, um, or like you just know that you're adding it anyways, I think that doing these things can just increase, or not only is it like about a newness thing, of it's more likely that it will actually be credited. And I think that it, it's also just good for general strategy points and for general like judge, how, how, how your team is judged and speaks that are given. A lot of judges just say things like, this team had like a really clear like like narrative and like they had a really good team cohesion. Um, I think that a lot of school judges don't like like thirds that are perceived to be like a pivot from the remainder of the case or in a lack of team cohesi cohesivity in general. So even if your material is not super new, um, doing some of the things that I mentioned are just good for like general style and strategy points overall. Um, so this is like re reconstruction stuff. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly, it, I, I'm not sure if someone can tell me like, is there a huge time rush for me to end or can I go a bit over? You can go a bit over, it's fine. Okay, um, I guess it'll probably be another like 10 minutes then. Um, so an another thing I just wanted to talk about that I think is quite important is breaking deadlocks. So what a deadlock is in, in a third is where it, there's certain realms where each team gives a claim that could technically be true. Um, but the problem in the round is that it's quite unclear what is more true and what is more likely because both teams are kind of asserting a particular thing. So to use kind of the economic sanctions example that I, that, that I gave earlier of like sanctioning countries that have bad human rights records or committing genocide or oppressing people, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's say like you're, you're in the debate and then two and like both teams give a counteracting claim about how a state is likely to act. Um, number one, like one team says, like the team who, who, who supports sanctions are like, these are really good because they're going to bring a state to a bargaining table because they're going to be desperate and they're going to want those sanctions to be released. And then the other team is like, no, 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 actually governments are not going to be brought to the bargaining table. They're now just going to get more repressive and start cracking down on people more to prevent forms of dissatisfaction with economics. So both teams are actually agreeing with, rel with re relatively similar premises. They're agreeing that economic sanctions harm states and they are agreeing that 
states are not going to like the fact that those sanctions are economically harming them because it threatens political power while being in some kind of way. And therefore the only difference is actually a small one between are states likely to respond to this dissatisfaction by trying to get those sanctions re removed or by becoming more repressive in order to mitigate the political backlash from those sanctions. Um, so it's a kind of a deadlock because because both teams are they both teams prove a lot, they agree on a lot, then it's unclear due to a lack of mechanization, what is more likely in the majority of cases, let's say both teams have example to like support their side. And thirds, um, I think it's often really, really important, given that I think that a lot of the time there's often like par parallel analysis or, cl or claims that clash, but it's unclear which one is more likely or more true, is you want to do work to explain which of those situations is actually the more true and the more likely one. I think there's a few ways to try and do that. Um, I think that firstly, this one's less effective, but using like empirical analysis, which is basically just like facts of how a certain stakeholder behaves in the past can be like quite important. So if there's a sanctioning motion about North Korea. You can be like, yes, they've come to the bargaining table multiple times. Does this ever result in longstanding changing of their behavior? No, they never explain why this time is going to be any different. Therefore, it's most rational for us to resort to how the actor tends to act in the past in the majority of cases. I think this one is dangerous because it can just be seen as being a bit assertive, especially if the judge does not know that context. But I do think that it can be a good like intuition pump to try and explain that. Um, I think that the more important thing to do is to give context. So what I mean by context are a, a description of what something looks like under the status quo, which can be used to explain what the most likely response is. So, um, for example, if there's a motion about like the U.S. engagement with like China or something. Um, if there's a situation where a country is like super, super desperate for like for like relief, like I guess like North Korea here just like works too. Um, if you prove that economic desperation is so high, you can then use that to explain why like, even if the state would theoretically want to um, oppress and crack down more, rather than reorient and engage with the international community, they simply lack the resources in order to actually engage in that oppression because they just don't have enough money for like to fund like militia people who would do that. And like even if they repress people, like the state still needs like more salaries to support things like patronage networks. So in this case, you can use extreme desperation to explain why one thing is more likely than another. But in this case, you want to give context as to why the thing that you're saying about a country is actually like a true one. So give structural reasons about why a country's economy is actually bad. So ways you might want to like do that are because of like COVID or talk about the economic state of like their trade partners or like their or who tends to like import or export like oil from them. Um, if there was a recent political crisis that's created like investor flight, like things like that, that the average reasonable voter knows are often a good way to explain what the world looks like. Importantly, it's often also good to give structural reasons when you're giving context about what a state looks like. Um, I was recently in a debate that was like some, it, it was like a China motion. Um, and it was quite a lot of the debate was dependent on whether the judge thought that China's economy was doing well or was doing poorly. And one team was like, they're doing really badly because like their GDP is the lowest that is the lowest growth that it's been and in many, many years in Belt and Road investments are failing and they're struggling because of COVID and Biden's taking um, not the most fantastic approach toward China and there's a lot of bad debt. And the other team is like, oh, but they're recovering faster than the United States and they're expanding regional he hegemony because the Belt and Road Initiative is in so many states. And like when both teams are just giving like so many like reasons that are kind of both true, but it's unclear why you care about more especially if the judge does not know about the region it's often it's often difficult for them to like judge that right so you often want to give structural reasons when you see a fact about a country even if you know it's true um and you're trying to break deadlocks why that fact is true so for example if you're making the claim that china's economy is currently unstable because they have an unregulated like shadow banking system like specifics of what like what that are not important for for, for, for this purpose though it's interesting to like read about you might want to give a reason about why um, there actually is a lot of bad debt rather than just asserting why that's like the case. So explaining why growth within China was often uniquely fueled by large amounts of state spending that allowed the model of industrialization to like take place can be a way to support the fact that you're giving about why there tends to be a lot of like debt in general. Um, so that's context. Um, another way to break deadlocks are to break down incentives of an actor and like what they actually want at the end of the day. So for example, if you're talking about a state that's ideologically motivated, not just economically motivated, even if it might be rational for them to engage with the 
international community because that might lead to like more money for them and more secure political power. Um, if the actor, given how they were trained and like are socialized in their own life, like for example, like you can give certain characterization that Putin's history as a KGB agent has reoriented how he has thought about the world in a way where he doesn't only act like rationally for Russia's interest, but is often guided by his like ideology. Framing an actor, for example, is also caring about ideology um, can be important in breaking those deadlocks if if the other team is only talking about why that actor cares about economics. I think a final important thing to do when breaking deadlocks is to weigh between different possibilities. So if it's unclear whether a state is going to be more likely to crack down or more likely to come to the bargaining table, you, you can concede that there might be uncertainty. But another way to kind of get past this is to um, explain why your, your pathway if it if it does occur even in a smaller percentage of cases is a more important pathway so for example um if the other two is making the claim that a state is likely to crack down more or get more like repressive um if you give a variety of reasons why crackdowns are already like super super bad and the state does it in their maximal capacity and therefore like the delta for, for lack of a better word is super small that can help explain that even if the other team's characterization is true um the actual impact for people is, is a lot lower such that like if a state actually comes to the bargaining table and makes larger kinds of change that are good for like both domestic and regional stability and, and human rights that matter so much it's worth a smaller likelihood of like actual structural change just like weighing uncertainty of what is more likely to happen can i think also be a helpful thing when breaking deadlocks these are kind of the main headings i wanted to, to like talk about I just want to make there were just a few extraneous strategy pointers that I wanted to make. Um, this will, just, this will just take like three or four minutes, then I'll open the floor to any questions. Um, the first is that you want to be strategically anticipating in third speeches, especially if you are third prop. The debate has not ended after third. There are still either another third or there are still two reply speeches. Therefore, you also want to think of what gaps, especially once again, if you're third prop. Um, if like, especially if you know that like third prop's a stronger speaker, because you often just know um, third op is like a stronger speaker than second op, for example, because you just know teams from like the school circuit. If there are other gaps in your argument that can clearly be exploited, uh, um, you often want to be mindful of what those gaps are and mindful ways that strong reply speakers can frame your case to make sure that even if you might be winning the debate after your speech, you are still winning the debate after the round. So an example of a poor form of, of, of strategic anticipation could be, um, I mentioned earlier in the path to victory part that you might have a really good third argument or like you might have a third argument, it doesn't have to be a good one, that was like not responded to and the impact is super large. And you might be tempted if there, if, if there is not a response given in second op to be like, it's too late in third op. Um, here's why the wing of the argument is super important and like you never responded to like any of it, right? If you know that in two minutes or in like sometimes even in 30 seconds, yes, second op did not respond, which is not ideal, which they might not have done because they didn't hear it properly or they were under time pressure or they thought that it was a dumb argument. If the other third can beat that claim and like, 20 in like a short time period or the other reply speaker can find a way to just easily outweigh the claim maybe it was well proven but not super important so even if you're like third op um and the reply speaker can introduce like like a new 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 wing um quite easily or sorry the prop reply can you often don't want to harp on that claim so be mindful that there's other speakers after you and think how they're likely to adapt to the kind of things that you are seeing um another extraneous strategy thing is like listening is super super important in thirds i think it's often advisable to like definitely find the best note-taking system for you but i think in the majority of cases writing less and listening more um is often super important especially as i flagged listening to the speakers directly before you is in my opinion like the most difficult thing in a third and the most important thing, it's difficult because not only do you need to listen to it while you're trying to write and think about other meta stuff, you also need to think of responses quickly to a lot of fast responses from, from like another third or from a second that are often given. So I want to find a note taking um, strategy such that you're able to listen more when it comes closer to your speech. Um, next extraneous strategy thing is it's often good to weaponize POIs in third. I think it was just often done poorly where it's like we gave a POI and like it wasn't like responded to. I think that one weaponizing POIs can be really helpful is if they made a huge concession in a POI, particularly to a principal, it's often good to point out where that case tension happened. Um, and then to once again, always be explaining why that case tension actually matters. I think you can also use POIs to frame as being like unresponded to material. If you want additional reason about why a claim is like defeated or if, if it's kind of new and you want to elaborate on that. Um, 
final strategy thing, I think it's often good to just spend some time thinking about what to do in different situations, not where it's like, not the kind of different situations in prep where it's like if the debate developed differently, but different situations of like, what positions might you be in as, as, as a third, varying from very comfortably winning the debate to under pressure. I think that two of the most challenging environments to, 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 to give a good third are if your team is winning by like, a 10 point margin already. And you're just like, I literally do not know what to do, which often happens in earlier rounds of WSDC when there's larger level mismatches between teams. Um, or if it's the opposite of that, where you feel like your case is being like absolutely demolished and you're like literally nothing that I can say can bail out the case. Um, I think it's often useful to think about what to do in these different cases. And I guess I'll just provide like brief advice about what I think are the most helpful in these cases. If you feel like you're like, if you know that you're just like obliterating the other team and you're clearly winning the round and like your case is untouched and like the other team's arguments were already refuted in like five different ways. Um, things that I think that are helpful here are to like, it's often like not only to be charitable and interpreting another team's like rebuttal, but they kind of hinted at, at like rebuttal that was like semi like legit for like the sake of like your own speaks. It can often be good to like read into that rebuttal a bit and then to like add in like rebuilding and fill in links, even if those missing links were like not actually pointed out. Um, I think another thing that's useful is to like mega mega way against scenarios that are being given by other teams and to have like a lot of weighing in your thirds. I think this is the lowest likely. It's going to be like from other speakers who already probably gave a lot of their effort like in any capacity whatsoever i know my internet um if even if the argument was like really impact um even if the, the the argument was like really impactful but not proven at all you might just want to spend some time like weighing against like the worst case of what that argument could look like and then explaining why like you still won and just doing some like gymnastics there um, and, and, and then also do, 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 do the thing that I said earlier, but a lot of buffering of like your own case, like, yes, you probably obliterated them in like rebuttal. Maybe there are some gaps in your case that you can fill by adding in some intuition pumps or adding in some illustrations, but like never be like lazy if you're winning re like really clearly, because that will tank your speaks. Some panelists are rogue. Um, speaks can matter for the break at world schools and like people just like getting high speaks. So like, I think that just do those things and think about different ways that you can like strengthen the case. Alternatively, if you feel like you're just losing super, super badly, obviously like remain mentally calm and don't panic. I think there's like very few debates that are like entirely unwinnable um, from a third, especially when you still have like a reply afterwards. So I think that's something um, that can be good to do in this case is this is one prioritization, the path to victory stuff becomes really important. Um, just like try and find like the light, right? Like, I think that weighing and framing is what you have to do in these cases. So there's probably like one part of your case that is like salvageable um, or like one clash that's like at least somewhat close. You have the largest probability of winning or like you have one or like once again, it's like a thing where like your third argument might've been good. Um, think uh, about the debate, like, like, a, like a puzzle. What is the thing that I have that's the most likely to actually be persuasive? probably run a lot of framing about why the thing that you have the most chance of winning on is actually like the one impact in the debate that like matters a lot. Um, a brief example of this before I end off um, is that in the very classic debate about this house opposes limits to free speech, um, I was actually in this debate. Um, on, on opposition, um, there was a third argument about how free speech is what often incites like genocide and some examples that were given about like before the Rwandan genocide, how there was so much so much inflammatory rhetoric on like radio stations and like quite a lot of characterization about why um, speech and rhetoric is a, a unique factor that can fuel hatred toward other people. And, like, yes, it's probably a stretch, but the argument was not well responded to by third prop at all. In this case, even if it's, like, it's a, even if it's a more unconventional claim, um, explaining how speech is able to uniquely incite like hatred that can trickle down into armed conflict can unlock like you like unique wing about like even a small chance of starting genocide or conflict matters more than other kinds of like rights based claims to like free speech. You can just give like stock weighing about why like the right to life and bodily to, and like bodily protection is the most important thing. Um, can be a, kind of a way to like massively pivot and sh and shift in third. So always be like if, like even if you feel like you're super under pressure, there's often something that you can do that you can just frame it as being important and then just win that very limited issue so don't give up in those cases and that's all that i had prepped um thank you for staying for the duration of, of this i'm happy to answer either any questions now if you want to unmute and ask or pm me um you're also welcome to message me on facebook like my name is the same as listed on 
on, on Zoom right now, and I'm happy to answer follow-up questions if you need to leave now. Thank you for the lecture. No worries. Okay, thank you again, Naomi, for coming. Uh, we really no appreciate it. No worries. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Have a nice week. You too.